Well, today, good morning, we are going to do a hybrid today uh, in concert with the adult Bible study that I typically do. Uh, As many of you know, last week was our emergency sermon, right? Break the emergency glass and you get an emergency sermon, but today, not so much. Today is an actual uh, overlap with the class that I typically do, and that's why I'm kind of hooked up here as if I've got, uh, you know, life support going or something like that, um, recording it for for YouTube and, and the podcast that we do. But today, we're going to go through 2 Samuel 21, and the uh, title is Ghosts of the Past. So what I like to do typically in my class is do kind of an overview of where we have been over the past few weeks as we've been going through the Bible. And so I like to start with timelines. And timelines are very important, especially in the Old Testament, because we tend to kind of maybe dismiss or not understand exactly you know, what period of time we're talking about and how long ago some of these events took place. Um, Many of us who who have been around a while can remember maybe the Reagan years, the Clinton years. I hate to use presidents for that, but, um, you know, maybe the 80s and pop music and stuff like that. Maybe to you, the 80s seems like, you know, 100 years ago. Maybe if you weren't even born in the 80s, it seems like a long time ago. Well, that was the 1980s AD. We are talking about the 1980s BC. And, And just to give you kind of an overview of where we're sitting here, I've presented a timeline to you of essentially the the years of the Old Testament and right up leading to the New Testament. And so you can see here today, and I got my fancy laser pointer, so you're really in trouble. Um, We're starting here in, you know, it starts in 1 BC. So just think for a moment how long ago that was. That alone was 2,000 years ago, okay? This is the time of Christ around 4 BC. He was born, not going to get into that. But that was the starting point. So we, if we were to draw this out, are all the way over here in in 2021 AD. So we're going all the way back, okay? And that's 1 BC, and now we're gonna go further back. So we are as far today from Jesus as Jesus was from Abraham. Let that sink in for a minute. Abraham and the patriarchs, we call them, the fathers of the nation of Israel, lived, we think, somewhere around 2000 BC. And I like to warn people in my class, the dates are not secure. The further back in history we go, especially before recorded history, which generally is, you know, the first millennium AD, we're not sure exactly what the dates are, but but we think we know roughly the time period. So this period here around 2000 BC would be the time of Abraham, the time of Isaac, the time of Jacob and Joseph. These, These men can be found in the book of Genesis. Uh, and their lives. So that was around 2000 BC. You skip forward here, and uh, you know I subscribe to the uh, early date theory for the Exodus, the Exodus meaning, uh, meaning the time when the Hebrews left Egypt, their Egyptian captivity, and sought out the Promised Land. Uh, I'm anchoring that about 1450 BC. Then you have this period called the Judges. And of course, we have a book of Judges in our Bible, records this period of over 400 years in which Israel was essentially kind of, and we'll get to this in a minute, essentially kind of chaotic. There was no single leader ruling all of the different tribes. Um, And and thus, God uh, raised up these men called leaders or judges to help to rule and and to to enforce security and to enforce religious uh, uh, adherence. The, the, the book of, of books of 1st and 2nd Samuel are taking place right around here, right around 1000 BC. And so we're talking here about Samuel, um, who his name has been given to these books. Originally was one book, now is two books. Samuel was the last judge of Israel, and he helped to inaugurate a brand new era for the Israelite people that we call the monarchy or the united monarchy, in which a king was finally... Uh, anointed and ruled over the people and and the kingdoms, um, which became Judah and Israel, the divided monarchy, lasted for hundreds of years, all the way up to 586 BC, in which Babylon came and finally sacked Jerusalem, burned it to the ground and destroyed Solomon's temple. But again, first and second Samuel are really focused on this period here of the inauguration of the monarchy of Israel. And so as you can see down here, we have Samuel, and then we have the first king who is Saul, we'll talk about in a moment, and we have King David. So let's go to the next slide here. <clears throat> what was Israel like during the period of First and Second Samuel? It was not a fun place to be. Um, this is a period at the dawn of the, what we call the Iron Age, in which a, a terrible cataclysm had essentially enveloped the entire Mediterranean region called the Late Bronze Age Collapse. 
And essentially, that's just a fancy way of saying all of the major kingdoms and monarchies of the region collapsed seemingly overnight, and no one is still sure why that happened. Um, whole cities were depopulated. Um, writing ceased. This is the, the beginning of what's so-called the Greek Dark Ages, for instance. Now, what this happened to do was give Israel a chance to get going, because no longer were they having this kind of pressure from their neighbors like Egypt, Syria, Assyria, um, and so on and so forth. And so they were kind of free to kind of chart their own course now without a lot of oppression from their neighbors. However, that didn't mean that they were, they were well off. They were poor. They were insecure. And, and I don't mean insecure like they felt bad about themselves. I mean, they were living in caves because even though there were, um, the major empires had crumbled, they had these guys to contend with. These are the Philistines. And, and as you look here at my map, and, and here we have a real map. For those of you in my class, congratulations. This is the first time you get a real map. What's that like? Um, <clears throat> this is the modern day country of Israel. Okay, so here's the Mediterranean Sea. And as you can see, there's really no coherence here. We have 12 tribes or clans of Israel all kind of inhabiting the kind of the same area here in this region that we call Israel today. But they weren't really united. And, and, and again, there was a lot of problems. There was a lot of moral and religious corruption. But we had these Philistines to contend with. And these were some pretty bad boys. Um, they, uh, they were kind of the bane of Israel's existence for this period and caused a lot of havoc for the people of Israel. Now again, there was all kinds of other problems, moral and religious corruption. Here we have the granddaddy of them all, Baal, um, an idol. These are, this is an actual artifact recovered from Canaan. Um, this is, this is the, the thunder and storm god Baal, who was uh, very highly worshipped, especially as you get into kind of the period of Ahab in the 8th and 7th centuries BC. Here we have Molech. I was going to show Asherah, but it's not family friendly. Uh, so uh, I, I debated that for, you know, I thought about blurring and, box, and boxes and never mind. You didn't, you didn't want to see Asherah. Um, so here's what happens. This is a rough time, and the people started to demand a king. Why did they demand a king? Well, they're looking at their neighbors like Egypt, which for all of the problems that were going on in the world at the time still had their act together uh, in, in a way. They had a pharaoh or a king, and they looked at those neighbors and thought, well, those people are prosperous. They're stable. Uh, they don't have, <laughs> they're not hiding in caves. Let me just put it that way. Um, they have standing armies. They have, they have material prosperity. They have education and writing. We don't have any of that. We want a king. And God makes it very clear to the people of, of Israel at the time. It says, you don't need a king. Who is the king of Israel? God. God Almighty. And God makes that very clear. You don't want a king. Kings are bad for you. They're men, they're not God, I'm your king. And if you have a king ruling over you, you're gonna get some of the things you want. And, and it's kind of one of those things, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. You will have oppression. You will have your sons and daughters taken away to serve in the army or serve as concubines for the king. You'll have, you'll have wealth, you'll have writing, you'll have stability, but you will have a lot of other things that you're essentially selling your soul there to get. And God is like, you don't need a king. What do the people of Israel say? Tough, we want a king. <laughs> and so God makes the point. He's like, fine, I will give you a king. He relents and says, I'm gonna give you a king, but, but you're gonna get what you ask for. And so if we can go to the next slide here, God decides that through Samuel, the last judge of Israel, he will anoint the first king of Israel. And that man, of course, is Saul, a farmer plucked from literal obscurity to become the first anointed king of Israel. And, and 1 Samuel is really a graphic and vivid representation of what happens when you hound God for something that he has told you you shouldn't want. Sometimes he'll give it to you, and he did, and he gave them Saul. And, and many people are kind of surprised when they read the Old Testament about Saul, the first king of Israel, because he was not a stand-up guy. Now, initially, things go okay. Um, the country starts to organize around a central bureaucracy. Um, there, is, there is some stability. There are some very clear uh, wins that the army has against their neighbors, and things start to look like they're going well. The problem is Saul doesn't keep it together. And through time, Saul starts to get a very big head. And, and Saul's big problem is he disobeys God. 
he blatantly disobeys God and is not faithful to God and starts to become faithful to himself. And it's all about Saul and it's all about his kingdom. And at one point, um, <clears throat> he actually has this, this, this event where he murders an entire city of priests because he thought they were giving uh, comfort and aid to the enemy. Now, now think about that for a minute. A king anointed by God who is now going out and killing the priests of Yahweh. So there are some very serious problems that start to arise in Israel at the time. If we go to the next slide here, <clears throat> what happens? Well, I think personally, God had Saul be the first king so he could make a point. Kings are not inherently good. Don't expect anything good to come from kings. But because I'm going to make a statement, God is saying here, I am going to raise up a new king of Israel who is going to be the archetype for one to come later in history who will be the king of kings. And who is that we're preparing for? Say it louder. Jesus Christ. David is the archetype for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who will come many years later. And so God wants to establish David and what we call his house, which means his family or his descendants, from which later on, hundreds of years later, the Messiah himself will arise. Now, of course, this all goes over while Saul is still alive, David is anointed. While Saul is still king, how does that go over? <laughs> Um, it goes over exactly as you might imagine, horribly. And Saul spends the rest of his life trying to kill David. And, and really, um, David, right from the beginning, shows how he has a heart that's devoted to God. Here we have an, an ancient painting of him playing the harp for Saul to soothe him. Saul was struck by evil spirits. And David playing his harp for him would soothe him and calm him. But David, of course, had his own victory over, of course, David and Goliath, the most famous story, maybe the entire Bible. David beats the, the Goliath, the head of the Philistine army, and the Israelites rout the Philistines. And David is just mag magnified amongst the Israel, uh, Israelite people. He is the people's leader. Of course, that doesn't go over well. Saul spends the rest of his life bitterly trying to kill him. And actually, Saul, at, at, at the end, kills himself on the battlefield and, and commits suicide. And that's the end of the house of Saul. And then David takes over. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. So <clears throat> um, <clears throat> one thing you might say to yourself is, and, and we talk about this a lot in my classes, how do we know that this really happened? And don't, don't pretend, I know all of you are thinking, you're thinking what I'm thinking. Is this really true? Did any of this really happen? And one of the things I like to do is call attention to the rich archeological and scriptural record we have of the past, which proves without a doubt that the people, places, and events mentioned in the Old and New Testaments actually happened. Now call your attention just very briefly here to what's called the Tel Dan Stila. Now this piece of rock, which may not look so exciting to you, unearthed in the 1990s in northern Israel, turns out to be a monument that a king of Syria, that, that modern-day Syria in the past was called Aram, was boasting of his victory over the armies of Israel. And in fact, in this uh, stela, which is written in excellent Aramaic, okay, Aramaic, one of the languages of the Bible, comes from Aram, right here mentions his victory over the house of David. Think about that for a minute. This was written one or 200 years only after we think David was actually alive and his, his house or his descendants were still alive such that this king wanted to tell the world that he had bested them right there, the house of David. Conclusive proof, folks, that the, the people of the Bible are real and every day we're discovering more and more evidence that that is true. But I digress. I also want to talk about what David did. And of course, more Second Samuel at this point kind of illuminates the reign of David himself. David did all the things right that Saul did wrong. David was faithful to God, and he let God win his victories for him. And make no mistake, David wasn't winning any victories, folks. Uh, he wasn't the one doing all of the winning. It was God himself, and he was allowing God to do it. He was faithful to God, and, and so he unites the 12 tribes. Over time, it took time into a unified monarchy. All 12 tribes of Israel united. He creates a standing army that is 
magnificently successful in routing their enemies and building the borders of Israel and expanding them. One of his most remembered acts is to make Jerusalem his capital. Now, this picture I have taken from the first century. So this is a picture of Jerusalem as it stood in the first century AD. So that is the time of Jesus. This is the Jerusalem that Jesus knew. But the time of David it was very different. This little sliver of land right here, okay, the, a, a collection of a few hundred homes, maybe a couple thousand people, is all that Jerusalem was in the 10th century BC. And today, you know, it would have just occupied this tiny sliver of the land that we call the city of David today in Jerusalem. So, so this, is, this is a tiny region that is much smaller in scope and scale than it became much later on. Okay, <clears throat> let's go ahead here. So let's start talking about 2 Samuel 21. And, and really it's important to kind of note, and we talk a lot about this in my class, about how the Bible was constructed and how it was written. Um, a lot of the content of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, tended to consist of stories and narratives that circulated independently amongst the, the people of Israel over time and were only later kind of edited or redacted together into a coherent whole. 2 Samuel 21 through 24 looks like it is an epilogue of material that goes back chronologically and retells some of the stories in greater detail than were recounted in the first 20 chapters. So scholars think the first 20 chapters of 2 Samuel and most of 1 Samuel were already kind of solidified. They were already kind of approved, so to speak, for consumption. But, but there were these other stories circulating and at some point, maybe after the exile, it's not entirely clear. The people of Israel said they wanted, to, they wanted this to be merged with the existing content because they didn't want to lose it. And they, and they knew that this was true. They knew that this was authoritative, but they didn't want it to be separate. So it seems like it was tacked on. Now, the warning, of course, is not chronological. So as you go through 2 Samuel and you get to 20, David is an old man. There's been a lot of war. Um, things are a bit in decline, but all of a sudden you go back and now he's fighting the Philistines and he's fighting the giants. And there's two poems of David and it's quite beautiful. So it seems as if this is some kind of epilogue that's been added later. One of the cool things of the very end of 2 Samuel that we won't talk about today is a cliffhanger of sorts. Um, like an old TV uh, show cliffhanger, the very end talks about how David has finally gone to Arauna, the Jebusite, who has a threshing floor on the top of Mount Moriah. And a threshing floor is essentially this flat area where the, the wheat or barley or cereal crops would be brought. Um, they, would be, they would be ground either by an ox or by uh, a stone or by human feet. And then the, the chaff essentially would be picked up by these shovels or rakes and thrown into the air. And if you know about, about agriculture, you know the stuff you eat that becomes your bread is heavy. It's, the, it's essentially the endosperm. You don't want to know about all of the botanical pieces here, but it's essentially the good yummy part of the wheat that you want to eat, but it's heavy. The chaff, the kind of the flaky leaf-like material that surrounded it has been broken off. And when you throw that in the air, the wind carries it and takes it away. And so this is a very simple process to separate the, the part you want to eat from the part you don't want to eat. Now that threshing floor on the top of Mount Moriah in which David buys will become the exact site of the temple his son will build in, in just a few years. So that's caught up. And that's where we're at today. And in fact, I have two uh, volunteers here who are gonna read uh, the Bible. Now, I have not put all of the text of the passage here on the screen. Guess what? This is your chance to get your Bibles out. We don't do that enough in here. If you have a Bible or you have your phone, grab it, let's read along. If you don't usually bring those, this is just maybe a gentle suggestion to do that in the future. Um, but let's go ahead and read, and we're gonna read uh, 2 Samuel 21 verses one to 14, I believe. Do you wanna do that, Laura? During the time David was king, there was a shortage of food that lasted for three years. So David prayed to the Lord. The Lord answered, Saul and his family murderers are the reason for this shortage because he killed the Gibeonites. Now the Gibeonites were not Israelites. They were a group of Amorites who were left alive. The Israelites had promised not to hurt the Gibeonites, but Saul had tried to kill them because he was eager to help the people of Israel and Judah. King David called the Gibeonites together and spoke to them. He asked, 
What can I do for you? How can I make up for the harm done so you could bless the Lord's people? The Gibeonite said to David, We cannot demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, and we don't have any right to kill anyone in Israel. Then David asked, What do you want me to do for you? The Gibeonite said, Saul made plans against us and tried to destroy all our people who are left in the lands of Israel. So bring seven of his sons to us. Then we will kill them and hang them on stakes in the presence of the Lord at Gibeah, the hometown of Saul, the Lord's chosen king. The king said, I will give them to you. But the king protected Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the promise he had made to Jonathan in the Lord's name. The king did not. The king did take Armani and Mephibosheth, sons of Rizpah and Saul. Rizpah was the daughter of Aya. And the king took the five sons of Saul's daughter Merib, Adriel, son of Barzili, and Meh. Holothite was the father of Merib's five sons. David gave these seven sons to the Gibeonites. Then the Gibeonites killed them and hung them on stakes on a hill in the presence of the Lord. All seven sons died together. They were put to death during the first days of the harvest season at the beginning of the barley harvest. Aya's daughter Rizpah took the rough cloth that was worn to show sadness and put it on a rock for herself. She stayed there from the beginning of the harvest until the rain fell on her son's bodies. During the day, she did not let the birds of the sky touch her son's bodies, and during the night, she did not let the wild animals touch them. People told David what Aya's daughter Rizpah, Saul's slave woman, was doing. Then David took the bones of Saul and Jonathan from the men of Jabesh Gilead. The Philistines had hung the bodies of Saul and Jonathan in the public square of Beth Shan after they had killed Saul at Gilboa. Later, the men of Jabesh Gilead had secretly taken them from there. David brought the bones of Saul and his son, Jonathan, from Gilead. Then the people gathered the bodies of Saul's seven sons who were hanged on stakes. The people buried the bones of Saul and his son, Jonathan, at Zelah in Benjamin in the tomb of Saul's father, Kish. The people did everything the king commanded. Then God answered the prayers for the land. Now, you can't say the Old Testament is boring. <laughs> Um, and, and maybe one comment I like to make to people who maybe are, you know, see the Bible as a bit of a barrier, don't, don't get hung up on the names. Totally get that there's, there's always going to be a lot of content that may seem confusing. That's why we have Bible study. But when you're reading it on your own, try and just kind of let it go. Focus on what's actually happening here. Think about what's actually happening here. So let's, let's look at what just transpired. Um, <clears throat> What seems as though has happened here is that at some time when Saul was king, he committed genocide against a people called the uh, Gibeonites. Now, I, I want to call your attention to the fact that this is totally in character for who Saul was as portrayed in the Hebrew Bible. So this is not out of, you know, out of left field. It's kind of like saying, well, what evidence do we have that Herod the Great murdered infants in Bethlehem, um, at, you know, around the time of Christ. Well, we have a lot of evidence that Herod was an awful person who committed genocide all the time against groups of people. In fact, his own family, um, his sister and, and his own um, direct relatives were murdered by him um, because he was a tyrant and uh, worried that everyone was gonna take his throne. So we, we look at these events and say, does it fit with the character of the person that you're describing? Yes, 100% here. <clears throat> Now what looks like has happened is, at some point after that, after David had become king, God was so grieved that Saul had unilaterally taken this act against, against the Gibeonites that he was going to essentially punish Israel. Now again, this is a whole thing. You can say to yourself, why is God being mean? Why is he being, you know, why, why is he punishing them? Well, it's God's world <laughs> and you're God's creation and he wants to refine you, and he wants to define you, and he wants to make you a better disciple. And in this case, he wanted repentance and uh, accountability for what had taken place. And, and in the past, God often used the natural world to enforce that kind of either um, carrot or stick. In this case, a terrible drought strikes Israel for three years. And in, in make no mistake about it, the people would have instantly thought, we have done something to grieve God, what did we do? Now, now here is where the application starts to take place. And I like to be very clear, we don't just read the Bible because it's interesting or because I feel guilty about it and I should do it or someone told me to do it. We do it because we need to understand God's word and apply it to our life. Here's the first application principle. David 
sought answers from God. If you look right here, right at the beginning, <clears throat> okay. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three years. So David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Folks, if you are encountering suffering or joy, an unexpected blessing or an unexpected uh, uh, test or trial, Go to, the God, go to God of the universe first. Say, God, I want to understand what's happening. What is, what is your will for my life, and, and how do I fit into what I, I seem to be seeing? Maybe I got fired. Maybe I just got engaged. <laughs> um, it goes both ways. Our first reaction should not be to go to Facebook. Our first reaction should not be to go and uh, complain to a bunch of people. That's a sin. Our first act should be to immediately seek God and his answers. Now, here's the problem that David does, and I like to make the comment here that David is a great archetype for the Messiah. He is not the Messiah because he's human, and he does some of the things that we would have done. The first thing he does is he goes to God and says, why is this happening? Okay, well, because of the, uh, the, the genocide that Saul had, had done. What should, David had, what should have David done right after God told him that. How should I fix it? God, how should I fix it? That should have been the very next words out of his mouth. Now, I like to make the comment that, and this is really important, the absence of evidence in the Bible is not evidence of absence. What do I mean by that? Just because the Bible doesn't talk about televisions and dinosaurs and rocket ships doesn't mean they don't exist <laughs> and they're not real. Okay, that's what that means. Now, in this case, we don't have any record that God went, I'm sorry, that David went back to God and asked him, or didn't ask him, it doesn't say. Now, however, I think in this case, the author's blatant omission that David went back to God is glaring. It sticks out to me. And in this case, I feel that there is evidence here that David did not continue to seek God. And why do I think that? Because of what transpires next. Who does David go to and ask, what should I do about it? Who did he go to? Gibeonites. The Gibeonites, the people who were wronged. He went to the very people who Saul had literally tried to wipe from the face of the earth. And we can assume there was very few of them left. So he went, he went to the defendant. Instead of going, God, he went to the defendant and said, what do you want me to do about this guy who, who, and his family who harmed you? Well, no big, mis no big uh, mystery here. What did they say? We want to kill all of them. We want to kill all of them. And so as we go to the next slide here, <clears throat> you know, I think it, it's clear that a sin has taken place. It's clear that God expects the leaders of Israel to repent and to, and to make account and, uh, for, for this horrible act. The problem is, David only did half of what he was supposed to do. He went to the, the grieving party, and of course they wanted revenge. Now remember, the Gibeonites folks are not Israelites. Okay, that's another important thing here. But that doesn't mean that God wanted them wiped from the face of the earth. And we talk a lot in my class about why God had war against the Israelite neighbors. It's a long um, uh, discussion. The point that's very short is, God has a plan for his people and he wanted to keep idolatry and evil from polluting his people in Israel as they got their, their foothold. Um, but not everyone was expected to be annihilated by any means. And in this case, he was really upset about it. <clears throat> now, what happens is, this really opens the door for what we call kind of this personal retribution. And, and just look here, as you see this, you know, this is a representation of what happened. So these, these men are essentially slaughtered and hung up for six months. Let's go to the next slide if we could here. <clears throat> I, wanna, I wanna remind you that for the Israelites, the, the book of Deuteronomy makes it very clear. You are not to leave a dead person unburied. As soon as they're dead, you bury them. That's why Jesus was buried immediately after his crucifixion. So already there's a sin taking place here that David allows the, the bodies of these men to be strung up 
for all to see. And they did it in Saul's hometown. Gibeah was his hometown, folks. This was total revenge. This was just pure and simple revenge. Now, if you listen to the narrative here, you heard that this all happened at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is kind of interesting because we're an Iowa culture and we, don't, we, we, we kind of maybe assume the rest of the world is their agriculture is timed the same way as us. It's not. In fact, um, in the Mediterranean, especially in the Levant, uh, the region that we call uh, Israel today, there's actually different growing seasons around different parts of the year because they don't have the kind of snowy winter we have. In fact, it's kind of, it, it's really more about the wet and the dry. And in Israel, in the winter, that's their rainy season. So somewhere around, you know, it varies every year, somewhere around October, November, if they're lucky, the rains start. And the rains will last all through the winter until about March or April. And then they'll stop. And then it will be over for another six months. And it's bone dry, folks. It doesn't rain at all. Now, the barley is actually sown because the, mild, the climate is mild. The barley can be sown very early in the year, like um, late winter. And it's actually, it actually grows and it's harvested at Passover. So in fact, the feast uh, of Passover is partially celebrating what's called the first fruits, right? The first, uh, the first harvest of the year, which is the barley harvest. So point is, these men are killed sometime around March or April of the year. The narrative says they st were stuck on those poles until the rains came again. Well, when do the rains come again? <laughs> November. Those men were on those poles for over six months, rotting, decaying. And, and what happens? The, the mother of two of them spends the entire time camped out at that place trying to stop the wild beasts from devouring her sons. What a horrible time this is. And, and I think the point is that what happens in the narrative is, is David realizes what he has done and what has happened by seeing this mother grieving for six months with these unburied bodies decides this is not right and we, and we need to fix this. And if you're very careful in reading what happens here in the narrative, it's only after the bodies are buried, amends are made, essentially prayers are, are given to God that God relents. And I think that's the point here. And this is one of those cases where if you ask my opinion, and it's probably wrong, did the men have to die for this? I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think that's what God wanted. I don't think he wanted revenge against people. I think he wanted David and the Israelites to apologize and make amends with the Gibeonites for what had happened. And maybe there was some financial compensation, maybe there's some security given to them, I don't know. But it's only after the people start to pray and David makes amends by burying the bodies that God actually relents and the drought ends and the famine ends. So I think that's, that is a really good reminder to us <laughs> to be careful how we separate our concept of retribution, revenge from what God is expecting. He may not be expecting what you think the outcome should be. Oh, maybe I should get even with my neighbor because his dog poops in my yard. No, maybe he wants you to go and talk to that neighbor and apologize because maybe, I don't know, y y you built the fence three feet into his yard. I don't know. Go to God and ask him what he wants and be thoughtful about what the right answer should be because you serve a loving and merciful God, not a God of revenge. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, and we're going to read the second part here, which is a complete, oh, we're going to, you know, turn in the wheel, completely different uh, narrative. 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 to 22. Again, there was war between the Philistines and Israel. David and his men went out to fight the Philistines, but David became tired. Ishi Binab, one of the sons of Rapha, had a bronze spearhead weighing about seven and one half pounds and a new sword. He planned to kill David. But Abishai, son of Zeruah, killed the Philistine and saved David's life. Then David's men made a promise to him, saying, Never again will you go out with us in battle. If you were killed, Israel would lose its greatest leader. Later at Gob, there was another battle with the Philistines. Sibachai the Hushathite killed Saph, another one of the sons of Rapha. Later, there was another battle at Gob with the Philistines. Elhanan, son of jer Origim, from Bethlehem killed Goliath from Gath. His spear was as large as a weaver's rod. At Gath, another battle took place. A huge man was there. He had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 fingers and toes in all. This man was also one of the sons of Rapha. When he challenged Israel, 
Jonathan, some son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These four sons of Rapha from Gath were killed by David and his men. Now, as you listen or read along with that, I am sure there was like five things that popped right out. You're like, what? Wait a minute. And then the next thing, wait a minute. I forgot to put the six-fingered man from Princess Bride in the slide deck. I should have done that. Um, Because that's also very weird. So what has just happened here? Um, let's, let's go through it. And of course, in my class, we have a lot more time to unpack this. And I ask for feedback and, and discussion, which is a critical part of Bible study. You know, I don't really like this, this lecture format. I don't really like to, to preach. I like to talk and discuss because there's a lot of things that maybe even I haven't thought of, questions you might have that we want to talk about. But I'll talk about the things that stood out to me here. First thing is, what has just happened? It appears this is a narrative to discuss at least maybe four different battles that happened against the so-called Philistine giants. Now, we'll go back to the story of David and Goliath, right? A remarkable story in and of itself in which a man that, according to the, the Hebrew Bible, that stood over nine feet tall, taunted the Israelites and eventually succumbed um, to the power of God through David. Okay, and and was killed by him. Now we have a story again of additional, what's so-called giants. Now these giants actually are referred to many times in the Old Testament, um, and they seem to be allied with the Philistines. Well, what happened was they have different names. In this case, the Rapha or Raphaim, okay, seem to be a tribe of giants that early in history, Genesis and Exodus and Joshua record they, they were a powerful force, but they were defeated by Joshua and the Israelites as they took over the land of Canaan, and they were driven from their homes. Now, some of them survived, and it appears as though they fled to Philistia, to the cities of the Philistines, to take refuge, and in so doing, allied themselves with the Philistines and, and essentially were hired mercenaries for them. Now, these, these people have different names, giant uh, Raphaim, also called Anakim. So if you've, if you've heard those, those terms, they're all the same. You might be thinking to yourself, all right, Brian, <laughs> I've believed all this stuff that you've been, you've been throwing at me, but now I'm going to draw the line. I have seen the videos about the giants, and I don't believe any of it. And you're right. Those videos are crap. <laughs> I, I will refer you to uh, Robert Wadlow, the tallest man to ever live in recorded history. That is a real picture. He was a real guy. He stood almost nine feet tall because of an abnormality with his pituitary gland, okay? That today is, is generally fixed through modern science and medicine. It is not so hard to believe that there would have been a group of people genetically related who were growing nine feet tall. If I saw that guy on the battlefield and he was wearing chain mail and had a spear, I would run. <laughs> okay? This happens. This is real. <clears throat> but what does it mean? And again, I, I try and make the comment here that when we, we read the Bible, don't get caught in maybe the ancillary details. What is it trying to say? I think the point here is that, the point is that God, each and every time David sought him, helped David to win victories against his enemies. That's the point. That's the point of the four battles that are recorded here in 2 Samuel. It's the point of all of the content of 1 and 2 Samuel. When you are faithful to God and trust him, he helps you to win. And win can mean many different things. In this case, it meant victory in battle. Let's go to the next slide because I think what also happens when we tend to get bogged down in the details is is exactly this. And this is where apologetics comes in. It's where critics of the Bible, and I still contend if you're a critic of the Bible, it's a a heart thing. The evidence is clear. People will find and nitpick all kinds of little things. It's amazing how many people will argue about things like homosexuality in the Bible or about giants. I'm like, oh, you're an expert in in the Greek for homosexuality, but you don't even know how many books of the Bible there are, (laughs) okay? What were the 12 disciples' names? Well, I don't know, but I know the Greek word for homosexuality was invented by the, you know, Catholic Church, and it's not real. The point is, we tend to get bogged down in details that don't matter, and it completely drives us off course 
from what God is trying to say. One of the questions that comes up here and is very confusing here is, well, wait a minute. It just said that this guy Elhanan killed Goliath. I thought that David killed Goliath. And in fact, that's what the Old Testament records. What's interesting here, and this is a whole different thing about, about how the Bible is written and how it is copied over time. Over time, scribal changes happen because they're human too, in which certain subtle details may change, but the overall message is still the same. And I will make that point loud and clear. I will go to my grave saying, the content of the Bible is rock solid. The meaning of the word of God has been preserved without error for 4,000 years. Where people get hung up is the scribal differences that they want to argue about till they're blue in the face that do not change the meaning. What happens here? Well, let me just say, we're lucky in this case because it turns out that a lot of the content of First and Second Samuel and in fact of Kings has also been rewritten by um, the chronicler who we think may have been Ezra or Nehemiah after the, after the, um, uh, after the exile in First Chronicles. And so we have literally the exact same story written twice in the Bible. Awesome. Awesome. Guess what we can do? We can line those words up word for word and, and compare them and see what happened. And that's what I've done for you. So if you're a genetic scientist, you may do this all the time with DNA sequences. We line up genetic sequences of DNA right against each other from two different individuals and we can see exactly where the mutation happened, the insertion and deletion. You can do the exact same thing with text. Here I have lined up the text of 2 Samuel and the text of 1 Chronicles word for word. Let's read them and compare them and we can see exactly what's happened here. <clears throat> and there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Okay, that's, in, that's preserved in 2 Samuel for some reason does not exist in Chronicles. Okay, it's fine. And Elhanan, the son of uh, Yaare, which means forest, Oregim, the Bethlehemite, okay, so that seems to be an insertion here, deletion here, struck down Lami, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. If I look at this with a critical scholar's eye, I know instantly and can reconstruct exactly what happened. Elhanan didn't kill Goliath. Who killed Goliath? David. David. We're still good. Whew. We're still good. And actually this guy, uh, Yair, which means again forest, struck down the brother of Goliath. So we're good. And, and, and again, this, this, this fills out details which have no impact on the meaning of the passage. But if you care about the details, now you know. You know the, the bigger picture. And, and I'll also point you to this origim. This means weaver. It's not entirely clear, but that's the exact same word as weaver's beam. It's thought that maybe this got duplicated and so, or maybe he was a weaver, we're not really sure. Anyway, I wouldn't say that it's wrong. Uh, maybe this is just filling in information we didn't have, but you can see the fullness of the text. Again, and maybe the application here too is, read your Bible and read it all. And, and don't get drawn into you know, arguments about taking one sentence or one phrase out of context. If you knew this passage appeared in both places, you can very easily explain to someone and yourself exactly what happened here and you can be confident in your, in your results. What is the take home here? Let's, let's go forth here. I think this is the point that does matter. God blessed David, a man after his own heart. And David loved God and devoted his entire life to him. Was he perfect? Was he perfect? No. Did, did that mean God didn't bless him? How many of you are perfect? Raise your hand. Oh, this is good. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have been blessed by God? What? That doesn't make any sense. And it's important to remember that what happened in David's life, he was faithful to God and he loved God and he worshiped him and he, and he sung praises to him. And God helped him. God didn't always, you know, it wasn't always roses, right? And, and it's no promise, you know, beware of the prosperity gospel that if you go to church every Sunday and you read your Bible, you're going to be a millionaire and never, never get sick. That's not the point. The point is you will be blessed to spend eternity with your creator in paradise. How many of us want that over a million dollars? 
You can have your million dollars. I want eternity with my creator. And God knew that, and he made David the archetype. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your understanding. Don't, don't take matters into your own hands. Don't be prideful, because that's our trap. I'm going to do things my way, and then I'm going to get the glory. Well, that was Saul's trap, and guess what? He died on the battlefield, killing himself. If we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you know, as we kind of wrap up here, David was called the lamp of Israel, the light of Israel. What does that mean? It meant David was, was the uh, progenitor for something much greater to come, a symbol of hope and security for God's people. David was a shepherd. David was a literal shepherd, and he was a shepherd of men and women. And God blessed his house, his house meaning his descendants. And we know now from the record that one of his descendants became the greatest shepherd the world has ever known, Jesus the Messiah, our king. How many of you have a king? Okay. How many of your kings live on earth? Okay. They're shutting us down next week for saying that. No, I'm joking. We have a king. We have a king we serve who loves you so much he will do anything, in fact, gave his life to protect you. And so our summary today is really this. You know, what are our take-home messages? Make seeking God's counsel a constant activity, not just when you need something. What do I say? God is not a vending machine. God is not a vending machine. Don't just go to him when you've got the munchies and you need something and push the button and expect pop and, and little Debbie treats to pop out. It's a constant activity. You can pray literally every minute of the day. You don't have to start with, uh, Heavenly Father, thou holy hand uh, blesses thy understanding, blah, 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 in your name, amen. That doesn't have to be your prayer. You can literally say, God, please help me. I'm about to go into this interview. Um, God, I just saw a homeless person on the street. What should I do about it? Um, God, I just saw a drunk guy come into the grocery store with a six-year-old, buy a case of beer, and then start yelling at his kid, what should I do? Those are the moments you need to seek God's counsel because he wants you to do something about it. And those are real events, by the way. Strive to be a good example to others. How are other people going to know what they're supposed to do if you don't demonstrate it for them? I like to, to tell people, I know I'm going over here, I like to tell people, you preaching like I'm doing today is not going to have really any effect on people. And I know that sounds kind of cynical, it's true, you know, do I expect that this, this preaching that I do on Sunday is going to transform people's lives and they're going to walk out of here and change? Probably not. What do I think? I think that if I am demonstrating love to someone at work who hates my guts, and I forgive them, and I send them awards, they're going to start to learn that that's what being a good disciple of Jesus is all about. That's going to change them, and it's going to take time. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It doesn't happen overnight. It might take years, but do it. Keep being a good example, and I promise you eventually people change. They do change. You changed. Learn to forgive your enemies. Don't have enemies. There's only one enemy. Who is that? Satan. He is the only enemy you have, folks. Adolf Hitler. Name your politician right? Whoever your boss is, that's not your enemy. Satan's the enemy. And, every, and God loves every human I just mentioned there. And try and welcome everyone into the kingdom, not just the people that look like you and act like you and speak like you. Welcome people that are so different from you, you couldn't even, you know, you've never even had coffee with them. Welcome them into the kingdom. Have coffee with them. Talk to them. Invite them to your home. You are the joy. You, you know, what I say here is share the joy you have in communion with your eternal King, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Thanks, thanks for listening.